Okay, good morning. I'd like you, if you would, turn with me, please, in your Bibles to the book of Revelation and the 13th chapter. I'm going to read verses 1 through 10, and we're going to consider the first beast, the political beast uh, that is described in this chapter. So beginning in verse 1, it says, And I stood up, uh, I, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the names the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. And again, God always blesses the reading of his precious word. So as we consider our continuing uh, look at the major characters, we said that in Revelation 12 and 13, we've got kind of the seven principal actors, if you like, of the, the tribulation period. And now we're looking particularly at this man that we often refer to as the man of sin uh, or the Antichrist, depending on your view. Some people see the second uh, beast as the Antichrist. I'm going to go with the first beast, and I'm going to explain the reasons why as we go. Uh, but I do believe this is that man uh, that we heard about last week that the world is waiting for. Uh, give us a man, whether he be God or the devil, and we will worship him. Remember, we talked about that statement. Uh, we'll receive him. Well, here we find uh, this man. Now, as we look at this man, I want to just begin by actually quoting from one of the church fathers. Uh, his name is Arrhenius, uh, and uh, he was from Smyrna. Uh, we looked at Smyrna when we looked at the seven churches, and he died in 202. Uh, what is interesting about this man is his link, direct link with the Apostle John, uh, because uh, he was a disciple of Polycarp, and Polycarp was a disciple of John. So you get kind of third generation now of John disciples, Polycarp, Polycarp disciples, Arrhenius. And he is the one that has the first extensive discussion uh, recorded on the Antichrist. And I want to just kind of read some of the things that he said. And these are all found in his, his Against Heresies, which is a kind of a long uh, work written against the Gnostic heresies that were particularly prevalent at that time. But he, this is what he says concerning this, this beast uh, who he calls the Antichrist. He is to be an unrighteous king from the tribe of Dan. Now, again, we won't get into that, but that's his, his view. And I've heard that many times. The little horn of Daniel 7, verse 8, who will reign over the earth during the last three and one half years of Daniel's 70th week, Daniel 9, 27. 
Irenaeus identifies the Antichrist with the first beast of Revelation 13 and the man of sin or man of lawlessness of 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 3 and 4, who will exalt himself in the Jerusalem temple, which will be rebuilt. And I just thought that was interesting that somebody is so close to the apostle John, uh, he uh, definitely believed in the coming of this man. Uh, of uh, his connection with Daniel 7 and with Daniel chapter 9. And certainly we're told uh, in first epistle of John, I'd like you to just turn there for a moment, that such a man is coming. First uh, John chapter 2 and verse 18 says this. It says, little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come. So there, there is a coming antichrist we know that he shall come even now th are there many antichrists whereby we know that is the last time and so the idea is that or there's a specific individual coming but already there has been precursors to this individual who have come uh, on the scene even in john's day and we believe there have been many such individuals satan seems to have always had his man ready for every generation uh, but again, we know that he cannot be revealed while ever the church is still here. But they've already, he's already tried this before. He's ready, waiting for, to put his man on the world stage. But the time is not yet. And so just keeping those thoughts from Arrhenius in mind, we're going to look through the passage. And by the way, it might be a good idea today, uh, if you have a Bible rib ribbon uh, or some kind of marker, to stick it in Daniel chapter 7. In fact, we're going to be going back and forth, Daniel 7, uh, Revelation 13, and Revelation 17. Those are going to be places where we're going to be spending quite a bit of time. So just keep that in mind in preparation. So verse one, he says, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and 10 horns and upon his horns, 10 crowns and upon his heads, the names of blasphemy. So John sees a beast rise up out of the sea. And it might be good just to say this, that uh, this is distinct from uh, we, we read in Revelation 4 about the four beasts, which perhaps could be translated as four living creatures. But when we look at this beast here and the second beast uh, that will be introduced in verse 11, I beheld another beast. The, the, the word is not living creatures, but it literally is wild beasts. And so the idea is that these these characters that are going to come on the scene in the end time are going to be savage. They're going to be wild beasts. Now, they're going to be we believe they're going to be human, but they're they're characterized as wild beasts. So John sees this beast rise up out of the sea. I'm going to say this, that I believe that this beast is both there is both a beast system and then a man, an individual who heads up that system. Uh, there's both an empire and a man. And we often think of that. We, we think of the Roman Empire. We think of Caesar. They're kind of, uh, they, they kind of go together. Uh, you've got the, the man. You've got the system. And certainly both are in view. But we're, we're thinking particularly of, of the man who heads up the system. Uh, that's going to be very significant as we continue. Now, it's interesting that... The devil offered the Lord Jesus power and authority and a throne and a kingdom, and he refused it. If you remember back in Matthew's gospel, chapter four, uh, when the Lord was uh, tempted uh, by the devil in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, that part of that temptation was offering the kingdoms of this world to the Lord Jesus. Uh, Matthew 4, verse 8 and 9, it says this. It says, again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of this world and the glory of them and saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. And of course, the Lord answers, uh, get thee hence, Satan, it's written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, him only shall thou serve. Now Satan, once again, 
will offer to this man, <laughs> the beast here, will offer him all the kingdoms of this world if he will worship him <laughs> and, uh, as it were, submit to his authority and be his man. And, of course, this man accepts without any difficulty. And so he says, I stood upon the sand of the sea. And now, just several thoughts about the sea here. Uh, I think it's important for us to recognize that often the sea is used in Scripture as a symbol of the restless masses of the nations, the Gentile nations. And so if we, again, look back to the prophecy of Isaiah 57, where we get uh, this stated very clearly. Now, the sea is often representative of the Gentile nations in their tumult. And uh, he says in verse 20 of Isaiah 57, but the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. And so the nations are like the troubled sea. And of course, we can look at any moment in history and we can see a picture of this, the fervent upheaval in the nations. We look at, uh, we often forget, my wife and I have been reading a book about Syria and what's going on there. It's been going on for 12 years now, uh, the conflict there. We think of Ukraine and, and they're just two places on the planet that show the restlessness uh, of humanity. And so many believe that because it talks about the sea, this beast coming up out of the sea, that this man must be a Gentile. Now, again, maybe that's not quite accurate. Um, they think because it comes out of the sea, he must be a Gentile. But, but we have to remind ourselves that Gentile nations have often been governed by Jews. I'm thinking of the prime minister at the time of the British Empire. One of the prime ministers was a man called Benjamin Disraeli. Uh, what do you imagine uh, his ethnic origin was with a name like Benjamin Disraeli? Well, he was Jewish. Uh, right now uh, in Ukraine, Zelensky is a Jew. And so uh, it doesn't necessarily meet, follow that even though this world ruler comes out of the nations, that he is necessarily Gentile. He may well be a Jew. And as you remember, uh, Irenaeus felt very sure, uh, this man who's connected with John, that he would be from the tribe of Dan. And so certainly uh, we're not dismissing the idea that even though he comes and he becomes, as it were, the ruler of what we call the revived Roman Empire, uh, we're, we're not dismissing the fact that he could well be Jewish. So the, the sea is a symbol of the restlessness of, of the nations, but also it may well be, and I, I particularly feel that it probably is, uh, the sea in view is the great sea or the Mediterranean, where all the empires in Daniel's vision, uh, the four beasts that Daniel uh, gave a, a description of in Daniel 2 and ta Daniel chapter 7, all of these four empires had access to the sea in the Mediterranean. And so uh, many believe that this is going this empire, this it's going to be global, uh, but the the ruler of it, the system is going to arise somewhere around the Mediterranean. That's why we talk about this revived Roman Empire. And so the Mediterranean uh, is perhaps in view when it says, yeah, I saw him come out of the sand of the uh, upon the sand of the sea. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up. So, who this beast, this wild beast, as opposed, as we've said, the four living creatures. And then there's a little bit of a description of him. It says, I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So quite the description. And so again. How do we find, what does this really mean? When we've got symbolism, remember, I hope by now we're beginning to see this principle as we study Revelation, that when we see a lot of symbolic ideas conveyed, usually the symbols are explained somewhere else in the word of God. And so we can go to other scriptures and we can get a clear explanation. What does this all mean? Seven heads 
ten horns. Well, look at Revelation 17, where we get more information that helps us to understand what are these seven heads and ten horns. And so Revelation 17, verse 9, here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Okay. Now, so if we were explaining symbolism with symbolism, <laughs> seven heads are seven mountains. Now, what are the mountains? Is this, uh, many believe this is, you know, Rome is a city built on seven hills. And so some have assumed that it must mean Rome and maybe the Roman Catholic Church or uh, the, the Roman Empire. Uh, but again, are mountains to be taken as literal mountains uh, on which the woman sits? Or is there some other explanation? And again, we want to see if there's an explanation in Scripture. I want to suggest to you that the idea of mountains is the same as kingdoms. Seven mountains equals seven kingdoms. You say, where do you get that from? Well, I get it from the book of Daniel. And I want you to look, please, at Daniel, uh, not chapter 7 yet. We're going to be in Daniel 7 quite a bit, but Daniel 2 now, Daniel chapter 2. I'm going to look at a couple of references, verse 35 and verse 44. So verse 35, it says, Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, of course, this is uh, the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had seen of this, this great statue. Uh, and, of course, Daniel explains it as the four empires. And then there's a stone made without hands that comes and smashes this image into pieces. And it says this stone became a great mountain that filled the whole earth. Now, what is that great mountain that fills the whole earth? What is the meaning of it? Well, Daniel 2, verse 44, we get the explanation. It says, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not left be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And so, clearly, this idea of mountains is referring very directly to the kingdom of Christ that will destroy all these other kingdoms. And again, what well, that's very important. Daniel 2 is very important because it's telling us that actually uh, it'll be a, a definite event where Christ comes and he destroys the the kingdoms and particularly that fourth kingdom uh, that will arise and, and uh, he will destroy it and set up a kingdom that will last uh, forever. So what we can say is mountains are symbolic of kingdoms. And of course, with kingdoms come kings. So let's go back to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation 17. You're really going to have to put your thinking caps on here today because we're going to be we're really going to be loving the Lord with all our minds in this session. Now, verse 10 of Revelation 17, and the, it says, and there were seven kings. There are seven mountains. So, of course, with mountains being kingdoms, come kings. There are seven kings. Five are fallen. One is the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. So with kingdoms come kings, seven kings. Now, again, I want to suggest to you, he says here, explaining five are fallen. So seven kings, five of them have already passed. And then he says, the other uh, five, uh, one is, so one exists at the time John is writing this. And then it says the other is not yet come. So let's try and think through this. I want to suggest to you, that the seven kingdoms that all had kind of a common link. They're all found in scripture. They, they all have two things about them. One is they nurture mystery Babylon. 
the Babylonian is a thing that began at Babel. They, 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 they nurture mystery Babylon, the Babylonian kind of system. And second, they're connected with anti-Semiticism. So he tells us five are fallen. Which of these five that are found on the page of scripture, uh, significant kingdoms involved in anti-Semiticism that were mystery Babylon uh, carriers? Uh, five are fallen. Well, what are these five kingdoms? I want to suggest to you Egypt. Remember Pharaoh? Remember how he tried to uh, destroy all the firstborn of Egypt? He was anti-Semitic, and he's, Egypt was that empire. And then Assyria. Remember Sennacherib? Again, he was he was the one that came against Hezekiah and wanted to destroy them. Uh, Syria, of uh, course, uh, even taking captive the northern kingdom. Uh, Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, again, anti-Semitic in the sense he, anybody didn't worship him or his image, they would be thrown into the fiery furnace. And we got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So uh, Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, Persia, remember King Ahasuerus, the time of Esther, had signed the decree to destroy all the Jews. Persia, Greece, uh, again, not Alexander so much, but Antiochus Epiphanes, again, his great attempts to destroy and desecrate the temple. And so five empires are fallen. One is, that's Rome, that's currently Caesar. John is on the Isle of Patmos right now at the bidding of the current Caesar. And then the other is not yet which will be the revived Roman Empire of the last days. Now, while we're here, we're going to. This is all going to be repeated when we get to chapter seventeen. So, if you don't stick today, hopefully, uh, it'll stick the next time you hear it. But look at verse eleven. It says, "The beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition." And so he's probably had seven kingdom, and then he talks about this eighth, <laughs> which is very interesting. He says, the beast that was and is not, and he is the eighth. Well, again, I want to suggest to you that the kingdom of the beast that we're looking at in Revelation 13 will be the seventh kingdom. And at the same time, it will be the eighth, because what's going to happen is uh, at the midpoint of the tribulation period, uh, the leader, the beast, will be assassinated, and uh, his wounds will be healed. Where do we get that? Look at Revelation 13, verse 14. And deceiveth them that dwell upon the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying unto them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And, of course, eight is the number of resurrection. And so when it becomes the eighth kingdom, it makes the transition from human. Uh, when the man of sin comes to power, it'll just be a human ruler. It transition from human to superhuman. Uh, he'll be assassinated, will be, uh, be a kind of this pseudo resurrection by satanic power. And he will counterfeit the resurrection of Christ. And he will be the eighth. So. Let's think about, that's the seven heads that we've been thinking about. Uh, we said <clears throat> the seven heads are seven mountains. These are seven kingdoms. And uh, out of them, of course, will come the eighth. Uh, then he says, uh, the seven heads back in Revelation 13 now, <laughs> I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and 10 horns. And upon his horns, 10 crowns, and upon his heads, the names of blasphemy. Okay, so we looked at seven heads, now ten horns. Now again, what is the significance of the ten horns? The horns, obviously, in Scripture, sim are symbolic of power and authority, uh, often connected with kings. So, for instance, back in Revelation 17, we're looking for explanation and so <clears throat> verse three, it says, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and 10 horns. Now we've got the same picture. 
17 and verse 20, uh, sorry, seven, 17, verse 3. There, okay, we just looked at that one. Um, verse 12, 17, verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast so all we're doing is we're looking at other scriptures to help us interpret the symbolism of revelation 13 1 and so it talks about 10 horns which are 10 kings and of course if we go back to revelation 13 1 it says and 10 horns upon his horns 10 crowns because that's what kings normally do they wear crowns and upon his heads the names of blasphemy and so these 10 kings, um, they're uh, significant kings that will uh, be around at the time of the beast. And they're actually going to give their power to the beast uh, and reign one hour with him. Uh, they, they're, uh, they're, they're certainly significant individuals in the last days. Uh, again, we saw that in chapter 17, verse 12, the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. So these ten kings, many suggest that they answer to the ten toes in Daniel's image in Daniel chapter 2. Uh, we might just look there, Daniel chapter 2 for a second, as we pull all these threads together. Uh, maybe that's why prophecy is uh, kind of popular and yet not popular is because it's a lot of work to tie all these threads together and to compare scripture with scripture. Uh, he talks in uh, Daniel 2, 41, whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay, part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. There shall be in it of the strength of the iron for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with clay. So these 10 kings. And uh, we, we talked about the ten horns uh, referring to kingdoms. And again, Daniel 2 uh, gives us further clarification. <clears throat> uh, Daniel 2, 7 says, Daniel 2 and verse 7, it says, They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation of it. Daniel 7, verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for the wisdom and might are his. Verse 24, he says, Therefore Daniel went in unto Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in or why this is not making sense is because I'm I'm reading Daniel 2 and I'm thinking Daniel 7. So forgive me. Daniel 7. Daniel 7, verse 7. After this, I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had a great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had 10 horns. Down in verse 20 of Daniel 7, it says, And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes, and a mouth that spoke very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. So these ten horns are fellows, and one comes out of them. Uh, was a mouth that speaks very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. Verse 24, and the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. So I think we've seen sufficient evidence now as we've looked at these various scriptures to understand what this symbolism is refers to ten horns symbolic of power speak of ten kings that will be around at the time of the this beast that will come out of the sea out of these nations out of the mediterranean area and he will arise out of them and become this dominant world ruler 
Then verse two, it says, and the beast, this is back in chapter 13, which I saw was like unto a leopard and the feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now, again, we're reminded of Daniel 7 because there's, when we looked at Daniel 7, uh, it, we, we saw that the, the four kingdoms there uh, that are mentioned, uh, well, the, the, the leopard represented Greece, spoke of speed and stealth and rapidity. That's Daniel 7, verse 6. The bear represented the Medo-Persian Empire, strength and savagery. That's verse 5. And lion represented the Babylonian Empire, dignity, power, and majesty. And, and so what we were saying is this, that this end-time beast, this antichrist, this man of sin who is going to come, what he's going to do is his empire will share the features of all these former kingdoms, all combined in this revived Roman Empire. He, as it were, he combines the genius of past empires within his empire, this last day empire of the fourth beast. And, of course, where does his power come from? Well, again, we see the dragon gave him power and his seat or his throne and great authority. And so we see that Satan has put his man on the throne at this time in history, that he's, he is empowered by the dragon. Uh, that's where his power comes from, his authority. Uh, and all that he has, it comes from Satan. This is going to be Satan's man on the earth. Verse 3, it says, And I saw one of the heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. So we need we need help on this verse, um, because some people think that it's, you know, kind of the, the idea is the Roman Empire coming back, as it were, from the dead. But we're going to suggest to you that it's it's really speaking of an individual. And in this individual man of sin is going to either be assassinated or executed in some way, and it appears that he comes back from the dead. Now, the reason we, we say that is he's going to make uh, the, the, the second beast is going to make an image of this man and command the world to worship it. And so clearly, uh, it's not a, an empire, it's a person who is in view. And so one of the heads uh, who is not yet, if we look at Revelation 17, we get an explanation of it. Revelation 17, we'll look again at verse 10 and 11. It says, there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was... And is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And so what we're seeing here is this. One of his heads, the one who is not yet, John, John writes, is not here yet. He must continue a short space. That's the first three and a half years. And then at that point, something dramatic takes place. He is wounded to death. Now, this, the word wounded to death that we, we saw in Revelation 13, uh, the deadly, his deadly wound, uh, it literally is the very same phrase that's used in Reve Revelation 5, verse 6, of the lamb as it had been slain. So very dramatic, wounded to death, just like a lamb as it had been slain. That's the picture. Uh, in fact, other translations uh, put it that way, the revised version, as though it had been smitten to death. Uh, Darby's translation, as slain to death. And so something of the nature of a public putting to death or even assassination is meant here. And yet it says, again, back in verse 3, it says, one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered at the beast. So it leaves the world stunned. Leaves the world in wonder. Uh, 
perhaps the, the media attention as this man who has come on the scene with as the man with the answers, the man the world has been looking for. And after three and a half years of his of his reign, suddenly he's put to death and the world is just uh, devastated by this news of this popular figure. And then in awe, as it seems as if he comes back, back to life again, kind of like a pseudo resurrection. And again, we have to recognize that Satan is always a counterfeiter. He has no new ideas and he's counterfeiting the kingdom of Christ. Uh, just as Christ rose from the dead, he is going to give the appearance that this false Christ also rises from the dead. And, and of course, we know that it's, it's, not a genuine power. Uh, Satan doesn't have power to raise anybody from the dead. And so uh, we, we notice how careful scripture is in verse three. It says, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. That really helps, doesn't it? As it were. And so it, it's kind of protecting us. It's saying that that he, he looks like he's dead. Uh, it, it, it's giving that impression as it were has the appearance of death, and then has the appearance of it being brought back to life. Its deadly wound was healed. We might put it this way. Satan stage manages this for the purpose of deception. Now, again, we want to suggest to you that all this is going to happen at the midpoint of the tribulation period. Look back to Revelation 11 and verse 7. Revelation 11, verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. So what we would suggest is this, that um, the beast is now satanically indwelt. As Christ was God incarnate, so now this man of sin this Antichrist is Satan incarnate. This is the point, 1711. Uh, it says, the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. It's interesting. Every time this man is revealed, it talks about his downfall. We see that in 2 Thessalonians 2 as well. As soon as he's mentioned, he's going to be destroyed by the word of Christ's mouth. And so he's always uh, his downfall is always mentioned at the time that he is referred to. But again, we have it here. So this is the point where the seventh head becomes the eighth. Of course, eight, we've said in the scriptures, a number of resurrection. He now claims to be the risen man alive from the dead. Now, what's interesting is Christ's resurrection was the greatest, best attested fact in history, and the world denies it. Here, the beast resurrection will be a complete counterfeit and yet will be believed worldwide. The world will believe it. And of course, uh, John chapter 5, the Lord Jesus told us to expect this. John 5, verse 43, he talks about his coming in his father's name. And this is what he says in John 5, 43. He says, I am come in my father's name and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye shall receive. So the, the kingdom of the beast will be worldwide because notice again, back in Revelation 13, verse three, I saw one of the heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast. And so clearly worldwide, all the world wondered at the beast. The world will go after this man. And of course, this event will be so convincing to them, it will actually result in worship. Now, let me just say this. I, I don't believe that as Christians, we will actually see the beast. I don't believe he can be revealed until the church is raptured. However, I do believe with all my heart that the, the beast system is already in preparation. 
I believe the globalism, the coming social credit scores that if you know if you don't kind of comply to the narrative, you won't be able to buy and sell. Uh, already in the UK, uh, we're seeing people uh, like Nigel Farage who are more conservative. He not only has had his bank account cancelled, he's been to nine banks and none of them will give him an account. And again, the idea is this, that if if you don't comply with the narrative of this coming world government, you will not be able to buy and sell. You will not be able to function. Uh, and so the B system, I believe we're witnessing it right now being set up. The globalism, the social status, credit score, the eradication of cash, uh, it's all just around the corner. Uh, could happen in the next couple of years, even sooner. And so we're seeing the system set up, but we're not seeing the man. We won't see the man. We'll be gone before the man. But we're definitely seeing the system set up. And notice in verse 4, when they see this pseudo-resurrection, it says, And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast and who is able to make war with him? So dragon is worshipped. The beast is worshipped. This is the moment Satan has longed for. Remember, he offered all the kingdoms of the world to the Lord Jesus. He refused. He says, I give you all this if you'll just bow down and worship me. That's the thing that he longs for more than anything is worship. And now he's finally going to get it. He'll be worshipped by the world. The world will worship the dragon, will worship the devil, that is Satan, that old dragon, the serpent. He'll get worship and also the beast will be worshipped as well. And again, we, we look back to the prophecy of Isaiah and you see that this has always been his desire, his longing. Isaiah 14 uh, in his fall is his uh, his rebellion against god isaiah 14 verse 14 he says i will ascend above the heights of the clouds i will be like the most high it was only god is to be worshipped and this is what he wants he longs to be worshipped and so he's finally going to get his longing his desire it says they worshipped the dragon which gave power to the beast and they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? Now, we might ask, um, first of all, why does it say who is able to make war with him? Um, what we're going to suggest, again, is we're putting all, everything together at this midpoint of the tribulation period. Once he is experienced this pseudo-resurrection, one of the first things the beast is going to do is destroy the two witnesses. We saw that back in Revelation 11. Let me just uh, ask us to go back there again just to see it. Uh, but this is very significant, 11 and verse 7. And that's why they'll say, who is able to make war with the beast? It says, when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them and so clearly what we can see here is this is going to be satan's final form of counterfeit religion in which he assumes the place he assumes the place of god the father and the beast or the world ruler assumes the role of the king of kings and the lord of lords the substitute for christ and the world goes after them and worships them. And notice verse 5. It says, There was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And so again, what's going to come out of his mouth? And again, this links us. It said, keep a ribbon in Daniel 7. It links us with the little horn of Daniel 7. It says in verse 8, uh, of Daniel 7, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. 
And of course, he's going to be uh, given 42 months. We see again in chapter 13, verse 5, there was given to him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given to him to continue 40 and two months, this last three and a half years of the tribulation period. And so it seems at this point that his reign seems secure. The two witnesses have been slain, as we've just seen, Revelation 11, verse 7. Religious Babylon has been destroyed and been replaced by beast worship. Look at Revelation 17 and verse 16 and 17, where we'll see that the the, the one world religion will be put down and, and destroyed and replaced by universal beast worship. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree to give their kingdom to the beast and to the words of God shall be fulfilled. Verse 16, sorry. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, thee shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. And so the false religious system will be destroyed and only beast worship will be only permitted one worship, one universal worship of one king and the dragon that empowers him. So two witnesses slain, religious Babylon destroyed. The abomination of desolation will be set up. Uh, we see verse 15 of Revelation 13. He had power to give life to the image of the beast and the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And of course, we tie that with Matthew 24, verse 15, the abomination of desolation being set up. Let me just suggest this too, that <clears throat> I also believe uh, that Ezekiel 38 and 39, uh, the northern invasion has already occurred, defeated by God. And this has brought the beast into the land to defend Israel. And so it would seem that all possible opposition has gone and uh that the, the the power vacuum uh of the defeat of gog and his hordes has left this world ruler as the uncontested ruler of the world and so it seems that he is secure in his reign and he's using this position now in verse 6 of Revelation 13, it says, He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. The target of his venom is clearly seen here. God, and not just God, but also his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Now, who are those that dwell in heaven? Well, it's the raptured saints. And so could it be that part of his ridicule is to ridicule those that have been taken away? It's kind of interesting that I just heard recently that in New Age uh, kind of philosophy, uh, for, for a long time now, there has been talk of the mass disappearances. And part of what they're saying is that that the the entities that are kind of the masters that are governing our existence, they are going to remove from the world those that are holding back the progress of our world. And who are those that are holding back the progress? Well, it's these Christians. It's these believers in the, the Lord Jesus Christ who hold on to this old faith and they are holding back humanity. They're holding back progress. They're, they have to be removed. And so there's, there's much talk, much uh, talk in the, in the circles. And of course, we know it's demonic behind it all. And this, this world ruler will blaspheme God, the tabernacle of God in heaven, and also those that dwell therein. They will be the targets of his venom. Now we can move forward with our plan. Now the golden age is coming to the earth. We have got rid of this religion that has held us back for so long. And now we can move forward uh, in, in a powerful way. And so, again, uh, there's given him to, to do these things. 
to open his mouth in blasphemy against God, blaspheme his name in the tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Verse seven, it says it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Now, remember, part of what chapter 13 is, is an explanation of how practically the serpent is going to do what he claims to do in chapter 12. And if you remember in chapter 12, verse 12 and 13, it says, Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man-child, in verse 17, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so we saw that when uh, Satan is cast out of heaven at the midpoint of the tribulation period, one of the things going to happen is going to persecute Israel because they're not going to bow. Uh, they're, they're cured of idolatry. They will not bow to the image of the beast and also to those that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So how is he going to do that practically? Well, he's going to use the beast and the beast kingdom as the instruments of his cruelty. And so that's why we see here, verse 7, it was given to him to make war. It's given to the beast, who? By the dragon. Given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all the kindreds and tongues and nations. Again, we get the idea that this is a universal kingdom. Over all kindreds and tongues and nations, he will have universal power. So this is the period when the second group of martyrs will join that first group in Revelation 6. First group, I believe, were martyred by the whore because they wouldn't join in with that one world religion. The second part will be destroyed by the beast because they will not bow to his image and therefore will suffer persecution. And so it says that he's given power to overcome them. Power is given over kindreds, tongues, people, and nations. And then verse 8, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Universal worship, except there is an, an exception whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Beast worship becomes compulsory and a mark must be taken, as we'll see later, to show allegiance to the beast. The earth dwellers take it willingly, but they also, there are those that have their name registered in heaven. <laughs> they will not line up to register as beast worshippers, their names are already written on high because they believe in the Lamb and their names are in his book. And then there's a warning given. And it's very interesting. It says, if any man have an ear, let him hear. Now, we heard that before, didn't we? We heard it in the seven churches. We heard it as a repeated mantra. If anybody has ears to hear, let him hear. But then it would say what the Spirit saith to the churches was a warning to the churches to lesson to learn now another warning is given but there's no mention of the churches because the church is already in heaven but he says listen to this warning Does anybody have an ear to hear let him hear what is the warning he's warning about the, the law of sowing and reaping and so what he says is this he that leads into captivity shall go into captivity he that kills with a sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. What he's simply saying is this. In this law of sowing and reaping, what goes around comes around. And yes, you may have power with the beast for a little while, and you can do all these things, but listen, you're going to go into captivity yourself. You that Kill, but you're going to be, you see, when the Lord Jesus comes out of his mouth, is going to come a, a double-edged sword. <laughs> He's going to be destroying all these individuals. And so basically, remember 
that those that are persecuting, and this is a this is a great word for the saints who will be suffering at this time. Remember, those that are meeting out this persecution will get their just reward, and justice will not be long in coming either. And so, how can the saints stay patient? Well, here's the patience and faith of the saints. They know that the man of sin, his time is short. And there's coming the kingdom of our Lord Jesus, where there will be great recompense of reward for those that have served him. And so basically, uh, what an encouragement to them. What a warning to those that are doing the persecuting. Payday is coming. <laughs> they will indeed have to reckon for their evil. May God encourage us as we conclude these thoughts. Amen.